We are The God Culture, a group of independent researchers with no affiliation to any denomination nor organization whatsoever. We read the Word, and we test it as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. As this is a continuation, we wish to be brief and jump right in here. We have proven the Hasmoneans have ties to Persia, but also initially to Canaan, as they are the progenitors of the Philistines, which include Nephilim. They attacked Judea, conquering it and possessing the temple, just as Psalm 83 says, but now we are going to support this overwhelmingly, as you've seen us do oftentimes. Wait till you see what the Dead Sea Scrolls have to say about this event. Not as scripture. It's okay. If anybody wants to have the debate, is it scripture? Isn't it scripture? We'll settle that right now. It's history, period. And that is indisputable. Especially when you see the dating, it was written at the very time period of this event. So, as history, these documents are dated in that era, and anyone ignoring them is simply operating in a paradigm of ignorance. And they certainly aren't scholars, or at least not behaving like they should. We already proved Qumran is the ancient Bethabara in our original canon series, where Yahushua was baptized, and where John the Baptist lived and operated. So he wasn't baptized in the muddy Jordan River, no. But in natural springs, just as John typically operated in such when he traveled. Read the scriptures, we test them all in that series, and you will see only one time in all of scripture does it say that he baptized in the Jordan River. Only one time, and that was not at Messiah's baptism. When we review this scroll, you will notice it matches Scripture, not only Psalm 83 exactly, but also the final battle that is recorded in Revelation, likely after this scroll was even written, probably by John the Baptist himself, in fact. We don't know that, but there's a high likelihood. He was prophesying. After all, Yahushua calls him the great prophet, this is exciting. Let's do this. We covered the list of territories for the enemies of Israel at the end of the last video. Remember, the narrative is taught as the Hasmoneans. Now, we are supposed to believe that they are tribes of Israel and even Levite priests, which is false on both accounts, as they come from Samaria, not Judea. They're Samaritans. They revolted in pious fashion against the evil Hellenistic Jews and against the Seleucid Empire. Oh, it's just, we're all so lucky to have the Hasmoneans. No, they are the wicked priests we saw in the last video. And in this video, the sons of darkness, according to the war scroll, which we will show you. So, what is this Seleucid Empire? Let's explore. Despite not receiving his share of this fallen king's empire, that would be the Greek Empire, until several years later, Seleucus I, Nicator, known as Victor, was one of the more capable of the successors to the kingdom of Alexander the Great upon his death in 323 BC. Seleucus and his descendants established what became known as the Seleucid Empire. Now, it's still Greece, but an empire within an empire of sort, or a renamed empire if you want to call it that, which lasted nearly 250 years. As with the other successors to Alexander, Seleucus was the son of a Macedonian nobleman, one of King Philip II's generals. 
While little else of his family is known, historians do speak of a dream his mother had in which he was fathered not by Antiochus, but a man, but by the Greek god Apollo. Oh, you mean the watcher fallen angel from before the flood, still worshipped as a god, even today? So, that, in other words, would make him a Nephilim, right? At least in claim. Ouch. Maybe he didn't know what he was saying. Oh, he probably did. In the dream, she received a unique ring inscribed with the symbol of an anchor. Ding, ding, ding. We'll show you what that is. According to the legend, Seleucus was born with the same anchor symbol in the form of a tattoo on his thigh. So he had a birthmark. Okay, so if we find a group prominently using this anchor symbol, say, in the, I don't know, Middle East, in the middle of what was the Seleucus Empire after it was dissolved, in that same period, well, wouldn't we know exactly what that's supposed to mean? And wouldn't they? Wait till you see this. This oddity of birth led him to later lay claim to a divine kingship, of course because that's what Nephilim do. However, some believe the entire story is a concoction. Right. There always are some, right? One can say that about every word of every account, everywhere, really. Some say, well, who's some? You and your drinking buddies? Well, maybe. Thus, the statement is really meaningless. And it's really just the author's opinion or trying to inject something. We dismiss that when we see it because it doesn't prove anything, nor does it prove anything wrong. And he simply wished to emulate Alexander's similar claim to divinity. Well, perhaps. Now, speaking of Alexander then, what exactly was his claim? In 334 BC, at the age of 22, he, Alexander, and his army crossed the Hellespont and embarked on a decade-long journey to conquer the Persian Empire. As a supposed descendant of Achilles, I thought that was Brad Pitt. No, that's the movie Troy. No, that would make him a Nephilim. Because Achilles was a Nephilim. Hmm. Alexander believed his final victory over King Darius III was his destiny. Well, why? As shown in the upper right, he knew of Daniel's prophecy of the coming empires and that the nation of bronze, Greece, from which he was amassing an empire, must conquer Persia according to the prophecy. See, these occultists often know prophecy, unfortunately. They keep that secret and hope we don't find out. By the time of his death in 323 BC, he was convinced that he was not the son of King Philip II, but instead was the son of the omnipotent Greek god Zeus. Now, Zeus attempted to court Achilles' mother. And there are multiple stories about that, but this may not be an inconsistency necessarily, as perhaps Alexander found some information that Zeus was actually the father of Achilles somehow, or somewhere in the bloodline of his parents, as Zeus did a lot of fooling around in a lot of ways, right? He is invoking his right to divine rule as Nephilim. That's the belief system. Even if these guys, neither one, is actual Nephilim, they are following that belief system. They are to rule humans, which is their doctrine, from their first conception. So whether physical Nephilim or Nephilim worshippers and apologists, Alexander knew He was creating the third empire in Daniel's prophecy. And he knew 
he had to conquer Persia as part of that to prove it, because that is the second empire that must be gone when his empire comes to rule. So, just like Alexander, the Seleucids claim Nephilim bloodlines in their own words, and as we saw confirmed in their supposed divine symbol of the anchor, so if we see a nation claiming to be something else, even at war with the Seleucids, who then uses this exact same symbol, well, we know something is awry. We will get there. But first, watch how the Seleucids, too, are aware of Daniel's prophecy and wish to fulfill it in its entirety. Seleucus followed the young Macedonian kings, Alexander the Great's, conquest or quest to conquer the Persian Empire and defeat Darius III. Right, because they knew Daniel's prophecy would come to pass. Back to the anchor. One great way to learn a lot about a leader's beliefs and mission is to review the coins and money he commissioned. These are coins from coin collectors, in fact, so the real thing and even authenticated. In the bottom block is the coin of Seleucus I, Nicator, himself. So everyone knew this was his symbol, the anchor. And the following empires knew full well what this symbolized. Again, we are told the Hasmoneans were enemies of the Seleucids, yet look at this. Here are two Hasmonean rulers, John Hyrcanus and Alexander Janius, who both use the anchor symbol on their coins. And we're talking about very close to the same era. They knew exactly what they were doing. Now, before someone mentions the song, The Anchor Holds, therefore, maybe this must be Christian, the word anchor is not even used in Scripture until the book of Hebrews, which was not written yet, not so long after this. So, no, that doesn't hold, and that anchor does not hold. Remember, this is even before Messiah came. Could this just be a misunderstanding? I mean, you know, I just, I accidentally picked up the symbol of the, my, the, the emperor of my enemy. Uh, oops, really? You are an emperor and you accidentally place the symbol of your enemy on your currency, on your coins? Zoinks! Fold again. Don't think so. But it does not end there, however. I know this reference says... At the end, it was phased out after Janius. But that's not quite true. Perhaps the Hasmonean dynasty did, but the symbol continues, and they knew full well what it represented. And it was continued by Herod the Great, the Edomite, hmm, who ruled under Rome, yet he uses the Seleucid symbol of Nicator. Weird. It is continued then by his son. So, oops, 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 maybe? Hundreds of years and no one bothered to find out where the symbol came from? No, they knew exactly where it came from and what it meant. So why are the Hasmoneans and even Herod under Rome using this symbol of the Greek Seleucid empire. Well, it makes no sense until you consider that the Psalm 83 war lays out that the Seleucids are part of this one big happy family, the synagogue of Satan, the enemies listed in Psalm 83. Well, not so happy, actually, and evil, really. See, Gabal is the seat of of the Seleucid power, modern Lebanon, but in those days known as Syria, coal Syria specifically, and Tyre also with it. Those are the Seleucid strongholds, and they participate in this war against Israel. 
It is said they defile the temple, but this is an excuse for the Hasmoneans to take control of the temple, which is far worse, and fits this passage, as that was their intent and what they accomplished in the Hasmonean revolt. See, you got to look at what they actually do, not just what they say. See, we have the Assyrian Hasmonean replacements of the northern kingdom coming down from Samaria and attacking Judea, which is not their land nor country, nor is the temple theirs nor in their religion either. In fact, you will find the Samaritan Pentateuch attempts to move the temple location into Samaria, even. But really, it just further confirms the temple, which is in the city of David, not even Jerusalem, was never theirs in the first place. And next, in the progression of leadership after the Hasmoneans, is Herod the Great. Of course, for Rome, but he's no Roman. He's an Edomite from Edumia, Edom, same area. And Edumia is the Greek name basically for Edom. He converted to Phariseeism, not the biblical tenets, commands, etc. No, no, no. He converted to Phariseeism in the days of John Hyrcanus, at least his family did, and then he, he continued on that. In the days of John Hyrcanus, the Hasmonean emperor. But he's not an Israelite either. He's an Edomite. Nor is he truly even of the faith, the Bible faith necessarily. And again, inducted into a false religion that originated in Samaria, which really originated in Babylon, Assyria, and those areas. So this alliance is not just formed for the purposes of one war, but this is literally the force of evil which will oppose Yahuwah's people and Yahuwah himself all the way up until the end, the very end, the final battle, which Messiah will win. Sure, they may say they are Yahudim, but they don't even know how to pronounce the word because they speak Yiddish, Jiddish, Jewish, not ancient Hebrew. This is the origin of those who call themselves Jews today, and most of them are just as deceived as you and I, but those at the top know this secret knowledge, which was really never secret, but right under our noses all this time. Back to the Seleucids. The Seleucid Empire was waning and growing weak, and they knew this. In the height of their power, and really even at this point, there is no way a group of priests from a rural town defeated them indefinitely using guerrilla warfare. No. They were already crumbling, and they knew it as they also knew the Fourth Empire was already rising in the West, the Roman Empire, because it already began conquering them. Because, see, Daniel cannot be wrong. The Seleucid Kingdom began losing control over large territories in the 3rd century B.C. An inexorable, that's inevitable or impossible to prevent, decline, followed the first defeat of the Seleucids by the Romans in 190. Now wait, wasn't the Maccabee revolt almost 40 years after they knew their defeat was inevitable? Yes. By that time, the Aegean Greek cities had thrown off the Seleucid yoke, Cappadocia and Attalid, Pergamon had achieved independence, and other territories had been lost to the Celts and to Pontus and Bithynia. 
By the middle of the 3rd century, Parthia, Bactria, Sogdiana had gained their independence. The conquest of coal Syria, and that's modern, Lebanon. You mean Gibal, yes, one of the ones on the list. That was their seat of power, the Seleucid seat of power. The exact territory identified in Psalm 83, in fact. And Palestine by Antiochus III in 200, and a brief occupation of Armenia made up, to some extent, for the loss of much of Anatolia, in Turkey basically, to the Romans. Almost sounds like they knew they were crumbling, so they move on Syria in order to take the Middle East, especially Judea, in order to set up an antithesis for the coming conquer. The Hasmoneans were that antithesis. To install in power in Judea and take control of the temple. Doesn't it? See, you learn more about a people by studying what they actually do, not just what they say. The decline accelerated after the death of Antiochus IV in 164, with the loss of Kamajin in Syria and of Judea in Palestine. That would be the Hasmoneans. But that empire was already unraveling, and all parties knew it. By 141, all lands east of the Euphrates were gone, and attempts by Demetrius II in 141 and Antiochus the seventh in 130 could not halt the rapid disintegration of the kingdom when it was finally conquered by the Romans in 64 BC. Note the final fall that history records for the Greek Empire is actually considered to be 169 BC to the Roman Empire. But that's okay. And oh, isn't that four years before the Hasmonean Revolt? Hmm, remember that. The former mighty Seleucid Empire was confined to the provinces of Syria and eastern Cilicia, and even those were under tenuous control. So here we see the transfer of power from the Greek Empire, the waste of bronze in the statue, to the legs of iron the Roman Empire, the Iron Legion. And what's after that? The very allegiance which is formed right here in Psalm 83. Where? According to Daniel 2.43, when he explains that they will mingle their seed with the seed of men to rule the final empire. The feet of iron, so still Rome, but mixed with miry clay. So what does that mean? Well, if their seed is not the seed of men, and according to the passage, it is not, then they are Nephilim. And that further fits Psalm 83, because there are Nephilim territories and people groups involved as well. We're not saying they all are. It's a mixture. See? So, what events lead to the Hasmonean Revolt? This is critical, because here we go again, another mapping, which matches Psalm 83. Imagine that. At the beginning of the 2nd century BC, Palestine passed through a state of crisis. Alexander the Great had conquered the Holy Land in 332 BC and after the early uncertainties which followed his death, it became part of the empire of the Greeks of Egypt, known as the Ptolemies. During the 3rd century, the Ptolemies avoided, as much as possible, interfering with the internal life of the Jewish nation, and while taxes were required to be paid, it remained under the rule of the high priest, the Aaronic Levite priest, and his council. 
So get this, as of about 200 BC, the temple still had not been defiled. And an Aaronic bloodline Levite high priest still led temple worship, just as the Bible commands. That does not change under the Ptolemies, nor did it under Alexander the Great, nor before that. Important changes in the patterns of populations, nevertheless, took place during this time. So they're bringing populations of people into these lands that are about to be listed. So, Seleucid peoples moved into these areas, irritating these people groups. Some of these populations are very ancient, in fact. Hellenistic cities were built along the Mediterranean coast. Now, that would include their temples to their gods, of course, changing the culture of these areas which these peoples rebelled. And here's the list. Such as Gaza, Ascalon, Joppa, Dor, and Akko, renamed Ptolemais. Inland, also to the south of the Lake of Tiberias, the ancient town of Beth Sheen. Lake Tiberias is basically Lake Galilee. Beth Sheen was reborn as the Greek city Scythopolis, Samaria. The capital city of the Samaritans was Hellenized as Sebaste, and in Transjordan, Rabbath Ammon, Amman, Jordan, today, was refounded as Philadelphia. In other words, Greeks, Macedonians, and Hellenized Phoenicians took up permanent residence on Palestinian soil. So they were transplanting people over there. And the further spread of Greek civilization and culture was merely a matter of time. Or were they aware of Daniel's prediction of empires and their role in the final empire, which they rooted the seeds at this point, right here in the Middle East, surrounding Israel and aligning with the very enemies listed in Psalm 83. Much more likely. There are Nephilim among these, and they knew prophecy especially. But look at these territories. Does this map not look familiar? Well, let's compare it. Oh, imagine that. The infrastructure for Psalm 83 was being set up right here in history. They didn't make it all the way to the very south, Edom and those lands, Ishmaelites. Not yet, but they will. But the rest, right here you see it, is forming and falling in place with their populations mixed with Nephilim and others. Even the Hasmonean dynasty does the same when they conquer Judea. You can see how they keep most of this alliance still intact. And an argument could be made, all of it, really. Because they already brought in some people from Tyre and Gabal, the Seleucid Empire. So, still there. And Ishmaelites are recorded as living in these other areas as well among these territories. So still a full deck under the Hasmoneans, really. We will show you it is they that hunt the southern kingdom tribes and force them out of Judea, not the Romans. And then they are the ones who war with Rome, in which they lose temporarily but they infiltrate even into Rome and eventually even become emperors. So they don't really lose to Rome in the end. They actually conquer it from within. Yes, the Hasmonean bloodlines specifically even. We'll show you. But in modern times, 
even scholars are beginning to come around, at least some. Of course, they won't attempt to connect things like we do, but that is against the thinking of their false paradigm. So understandable, but at least they're bending in the right direction. Look at this. Here's another map, by the way, which places Moda'in outside of Judea, even under the Hasmoneans. So they certainly knew they didn't come from Judea. Notice, too, Ein Gedi is also not considered within Judea either. And that is where the Essene headquarters was, again, not Qumran, which we prove in our original canon series, so you'll have to go watch that to see all of the abundant evidence. There is so much more to this story that we, than what we've been told on every level. Even the book of Maccabees reveals more than we are told about this story. In 2 Maccabees 5.11, when these happenings were reported to the king, that's Antiochus Epiphanes, who was in Egypt in war with the Ptolemies at the time, so doing pretty important work. But what does he do? Well, he thought that Judea was in revolt. Why would he think that? Something was happening, right? Raging like a wild animal. Well, something was definitely happening then, right? I mean, was he just crazy? No. He set out from Egypt, so he ended his war, and goes and took Jerusalem by storm. He ordered his soldiers to cut down without mercy those whom they met, and to slay those who took refuge in their houses. There was a massacre of young and old, a killing of women, and children, a slaughter of virgins and infants. Boy, this guy must be incredibly evil. Or, this is manufactured and lined with a whole lot of leaven. And that seems far more obvious to us. In the space of three days, 80,000 were lost, 40,000 meeting a violent death and the same number being sold into slavery. See, and they're attempting to paint, paint Antiochus as the evil villain. And perhaps he was. We're not saying he was a good guy at all. They forget that they just told us that there was a civil war that broke out in Judea first before his return. If the Maccabees revolted in response to Antiochus, well, this makes no sense. Do scholars even agree with this? Well, they are now questioning this as we are. Traditionally, as expressed in the first and second books of the Maccabees, the Maccabean revolt was painted as a national resistance to a foreign political and cultural oppression. We just showed you that Maccabees doesn't even agree with itself. Something happened that caused Antiochus to leave his war in Egypt to return to Judea. And most likely, it was time for him to play his role indeed. But there was a war that already broke out. Or he would not have returned and left his war with the Ptolemies. It doesn't make sense. In modern times, however, scholars have argued that the king was instead intervening in a civil war, so they're agreeing that that is in fact the case, between the traditionalist Jews in the country and the Hellenized Jews in Jerusalem. Now, do these guys know the difference between Judea and ancient Israel before it was split? It seems not. It seems like they apply the modern paradigm of what they call Israel, and then, oh, well, everything's in Israel. No. All that was left was Judea back in those days. There was no northern Israel in that area. They were lost tribes, all of them. They can't even look at a map to see that the Hasmoneans came from a different country, not Judea. That's pretty bad. But let's see, according to Joseph P. Schultz, 
Modern scholarship, on the other hand, considers the Maccabean Revolt less as an uprising against foreign oppression than as a civil war between the Orthodox and Reformist parties in the Jewish camps. As if either of those even make sense in that era. But, okay. Now, we hear this, and immediately many will think in the modern paradigm. Orthodox Jews versus Reformed Jews, right? Wrong. That's a false paradigm, which did not exist back then. There's nothing in the Bible that ever indicates such. You have tribes of Israel in Judea that agreeably had lost their way, no doubt. Yet, there were still some among them that were keeping the commandments and the feasts. There were those that were still temple priests who remained holy, as evidenced by John the Baptist's father, even. So to claim all of Judea was Hellenized and place it in such a box is not scholarly at all, but rather stupid, really. On the obverse side, you have the Samaritans who infused Yahuwah and the rituals of the Israelites into their religion, falsely so. Those are the two paradigms, and that would be your civil war. On the one hand, the tribes of Israel, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, all who were left, from Jacob, the bloodline of Abraham, and on the other, you have Persian, because that's their origin, Media, Persia, Assyria, Zoroastrian Kabbalists, who take that religion and try to add Yahuwah and the rituals of Israel, which he rejected then and he rejects now. Their God was Ashima, Hashem, and still is to this day. Which is why you hear that in the new religion, which is that infusion called Rabbinic Judaism today, or better, formally called Phariseeism, which Messiah rebuked as against the commandments of Yahuwah in Mark 7. And their twisting of the Torah causes it to be one of none effect. That's what Messiah said. But the evidence in history is far better supported than what scholars may now have arrived at thinking, or even what the book of Maccabees relate. We know this because the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and translated, and even though many still treat them as documents of leprosy, Forget the argument over whether they are scripture or not. They are history, specifically from this exact Hasmonean era. So to ignore them is insanity. And they address this very issue, specifically Psalm 83. Likely written by John the Baptist himself in some cases, as we prove in our original canon series. He lived in Qumran, not Essenes, whom Pliny, the elder, locates 25 miles south of there. And we will fully identify as one of the enemies listed in the Psalm 83 roster who hates Israel. It's time to open the war scrolls from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now this is going to blow you away. Again, we are not convening a council today to induct this into the canon of Scripture so you can breathe and relax. Everything will be safe here as far as the use of the Dead Sea Scrolls. No worries. But to ignore this is history in a period that has very little written documentation would literally be insanity and unscholarly. This tells the whole story connecting everything we have discussed. And again, it is support, not the meat of the case, though very damning evidence to the book of Maccabees, which, 
Though every book of the Old Testament today was found in this Qumran library, except Esther, Maccabees also was not among them. None of the Maccabees books. The reason will be obvious in a few minutes, as this community of John the Baptist railed against the Hasmoneans as the wicked priest whom we already covered, and now the sons of darkness. Ooh. This is why we label them that way on the opening trailer. It also identifies the teacher of righteousness, which we believe is John the Baptist, as if it were Yahusha, not only would it record his death, but it certainly would include at least the most significant event in all of history that occurred just three days later, the resurrection. And who killed John? Oh, this is going to be no surprise. The Psalm 83 enemies did, for it was their bloodline who wanted his head. And we'll show you. The war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness, also known as war rule, rule of war, and the war scroll, is a manual for military organization and strategy. Oh yeah, and they forgot history, duh. That was discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is possible that the war of the Messiah is the conclusion to this document. No, not just possible. It is definite. And by the way, this was written before Revelation. So likely, partly the basis for Revelation. Or at least John seeing the same things. Did we all forget John the Baptist was a great prophet? First and foremost? Scholars seem to forget that too often. Two time periods have been put forward and defended as the most probable time of composition. So either it was the Seleucid period, and some believe it's the Roman period. Now bear in mind, this is talking about when it was written, okay? Not necessarily when the events occurred. This does not actually matter as the Hasmoneans, Edomites, Alliance, continued to rule Judea and the temple in both periods. So it really doesn't matter which it was written in. Because the defilement of the temple was still occurring and had been all the way back to the Hasmonean revolt. Even Caiaphas, which is a Greek name, not a Hebrew one, and it should be a Hebrew one. He was no Aaronic Levite high priest in the days of Messiah, which was after this was written. The Aaronic Levite bloodline fled into the desert of Judea and lived in a compound where they kept a library. It was called Bethabara in Greek, Betharaba in Hebrew. And it is modern Qumran, which is a fraudulent name, still being applied, even though one can easily from Scripture identify exactly what town that was in Scripture. Joshua nails it. It's nailed in the Greek. It's nailed on the Madaba map and other maps. And they knew this all the way up until about 1901, at least, from the many maps that we've seen. But then they forgot. So, oops. Because that is how they treat history. They drop what they don't want you to know. The Seleucid period proposals include the very beginning of the Maccabean Revolt, 165 or 164 BC. The height of Jonathan's military power and the reign of John Hyrcanus. Again, the period does not change the war that is raging as this is a spiritual battle that only begun in 165 AD or so. And really, it's the age-old battle of the Israelites when they entered the land, 
which has origins all the way back to before the flood with the watcher fallen angels and their offspring, the Nephilim, the very cause of the flood. Remember, this is already a long video, so we are not reading through the whole war scroll here. But we will do this in our original canon series in time, as we plan to cover all of the Dead Sea Scrolls, test them all, and vet them all with scripture. These are just the cliff notes. These scrolls contain an apocalyptic prophecy, right? So written by a prophet, right? Who was the prophet in that day? John the Baptist. So likely, he's the writer of a war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. The war is described in two distinct parts. First, the war against the Kittim, described as a battle between the sons of light, consisting of, so who are the sons of light? The sons of Levi, the sons of Judah, and the sons of Benjamin, and the exiled of the desert in Qumran, Bethabara. Against, so you're talking about the southern kingdom, actual Judea, bloodline Judea, versus its conquerors. Now this list is going to look just like Psalm 83. Here we go again. Against Edom, Moab, the sons of Ammon, the Amalekites, and Philistia, and their allies, the Katim of Asher, Assyrians, referred to collectively as the army of Belial, Satan and those who assist them from among the wicked, who violate the covenant. So they're men of iniquity. They're violating the covenant, yet they took over the temple as temple priests. How does that work? Now, these territories we'll map out in a minute, but you notice these are looking awfully familiar. The second part of the war, and this is fascinating, the War of Divisions is described as the Sons of Light. Now, okay, something's changed. The United Twelve Tribes of Israel. Whoa! Yet more proof. The Lost Tribes do not return until the final days, because that's when this happens. Cool. Notice, only Judea in the first war meaning the days when the temple stood, as we have been saying, and really before that, at some point, which it pinpoints, the Hasmoneans as the enemy, the sons of darkness, as well as, and their allies, as well as the wicked priest, specifically the Hasmoneans. So how could scholarship even begin to misunderstand this, really? They live in an, and are trained in to a false paradigm that's loaded with leaven from the Pharisees and from Zionism especially. Conquering the nations of vanity. In the end, all of darkness is to be destroyed. Now, when is that? We know when that happens. That is the final battle that Messiah wins. And light will live in peace for all eternity. Got that? All eternity. When does Messiah reign? On the day of judgment. And for all eternity. Yes. What is this? It's Revelation. Before Revelation was even written. But far more than that, this ties the battle of Psalm 83 and its enemies, the same exact players, to the very same enemies in the last days Whoa! For those scholars who can't figure out who the sons of light might be and cannot seem to be able to read the war scroll, just go look up the prophecy of Zacharias, John's father. When John was born, he specifically describes John as a son of light. So this is not some weird title out there that no one could possibly connect. John the Baptist is a son of light, a leader of the sons 
of light in his era. Now we cover that in the original canon series in more detail. The text goes on to detail inscriptions for trumpets and banners for the war and liturgies for the priest during the conflict. So, wait a minute. I thought the battle was between Hellenistic Jews and Orthodox Jews. No, that is false. The Battle of the Sons of Light. First, the southern kingdom, who is attacked in Psalm 20, or 83. Because the ten tribes of the north are no longer in Israel, even in 165 B.C., and then all twelve tribes unite in the end, and the final battle will be a triumph over evil forever. Thank you, Yahusha. The sons of darkness are the enemies of Psalm 83. And this all happened in the Hasmonean era. The Hasmoneans just one faction, and we'll cover all of them. But here we have the list again, consistent. The Katim of Asher are the Assyrians who migrated into the northern kingdom replacing Israel. The Seleucids from Gebal, their seat of power, Lebanon, or at that time, Coal, Syria. And Tyre, in fact, Psalm 83 says the inhabitants of Tyre, not specifically Tyre itself. And we know that inhabitants of the Seleucid Empire were already moved down into these areas, which we mapped out that fit these exact same territories. They were moved into these other areas of Sumeria, Philistia, etc., and among the others before the Hasmonean Revolt, or better termed, the Psalm 83 Conquest. Ishmaelites are also recorded as living among these other populations as well. And again, it says Ishmaelites but does not specify that it is the Nabataeans that we point out on the map, nor the ones from Saudi Arabia, because Ishmaelites also inhabited Saudi Arabia. So it is saying the same thing. Wow. And those same sons of darkness continue their evil all the way up until the end of days, when Yahusha deals with them once and for all. We're seeing them operate today. When we show you on our opening trailer, the wicked priest conquers the teacher of righteousness. First, we refer to John the Baptist, not Messiah. And second, that is what happens in Psalm 83. And that is what the War Scroll says happens. But it is not the end of the story, for there is a final battle coming, and that will be won by the Sons of Light. Messiah will win that war. And looking again in comparison with the Hasmonean map, the War Scroll is an exact match to the Hasmonean territories. So can a case be made in any part that Hasmoneans were men of Yahuwah? No. Katim was son of Javan, who received Greece. The Seleucids were part of the Greek Empire. That fits. But specifically, their seat of power was Gabal, Lebanon, Lebanon or Kol, Syria at the time, and Tyre. Ezekiel equates Katim and Asher, Assyria, as well. And Daniel 11, if you read the whole thing, actually identifies another group of enemies that battle the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Or the king of the north, the king of the south. As Greece, on one side, it's Greece, Katim, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. Same names keep coming up time and time again. 
Well, let's look further at their coins, which we already showed you include the very seal and symbol of the Seleucids, the anchor, which it should not, that is out of place, unless they are the same. And they are. Here we find the cornucopia, the horn of plenty, or whatever you want to call it, of Greek mythology in four different rulers of the Hasmoneans. This is representative of the Greek pantheon of worship, of the fertility goddess, who has many names throughout history but originates in Babylon after the flood as Inanna or Ishtar. And not a scriptural symbol of any sort, which a true high priest Remember, these guys installed themselves as high priests in the temple, replacing Aaronic Levite priests. Not good. And then, tapos, there is the pomegranate, an occult emblem since ancient times, associated with the goddess Aphrodite, in this case, the goddess of love but really also the goddess of fertility. So two symbols for the same goddess figure in history. These guys brought their goddess, Ishtar, Ashma, all the same with them when they came into Samaria and they brought it into Judea too. And then, Tapos, the star of Ishtar, or Inanna. The Bible never describes a symbol of a star ever being used for Yah's people. It is mentioned twice as a pagan symbol, the star of Remphan and Kwan. The star of Ishtar is many times shown with eight points, and that's here. However, the six-pointed star is also hers. Hello, modern Israel. This is not the worship of Yah's people. It is the worship of Assyria, Persia, Babylon, same area where the replacements of northern Israel originated. This is their worship, their gods that they brought into these areas. This is why they put it on their money, because they still worship her. Because they are not Israelites, and the same reason you see it on their flag today. It was never a symbol of the Yahudim. And let's look at the Hasmoneans. Mattathias, who murdered a man for practicing Hellenism, hmm. and Judah carried out the conquest of Judea, and the rest unified the entire land under the powers of the Psalm 83 enemies. That doesn't sound good. Follow the trail and see them begin to mix with Herod the Great, and you'll see it with his sons and so on. Even Josephus, by his own admission, and we'll cover him in an entire video, was a Hasmonean. You can see these are Hebrew and Greek names mixed, but no one seems to know where this name Hyrcanus, John Hyrcanus, Yohanan is Hebrew, but Hyrcanus not. They don't know where it came from. Read up on it, you'll see many scholars saying, I don't know. His first name is Hebrew, but his last name, well, this tells us much of their origins because in his name they are commemorating their place of origin. That's because Hyrcanus or Hyrcania is Old Persian, the region around the Caspian Sea, which in ancient times was even known as the Hyrcanian Sea. This was a big name in ancient times. How can anyone miss that? 
Accounts differ as to the exact territory. Some have it encompassing the entire sea, which is fine. Some just a southern portion here or a portion over there. Doesn't matter. They come from that area around the Hyrcanian Sea, and that's close enough. Because it places them exactly where we said they would be. And, in fact, it's confirmed further, the name of a town in Turkey where Hyrcanians were settled by Persia. So get this, Persia was actually taking Hyrcanians and settling them in other territories, just like Assyria did for the Hyrcanians, the Hasmoneans, that they brought in from Assyria, from the area of the Hyrcanian Sea, in fact. And in Lydia, nonetheless, in Turkey, is where this was settled, which is where, what's where the synagogue of Satan is recorded as operating in Revelation, where the seven ecclesias are laid out. And it's actually right there in the area of the very seat of Satan, his throne. Maybe a good place to relocate if, well, maybe he is your God. It means wolf's land. Now that's odd. Wait, does that give new meaning to wolves in sheep's clothing? I mean, isn't that what they're doing? They're imposters trying to pose as rabbis, as the high priest in the temple even, and really they're ravenous wolves. But they're wearing the temple clothing. Hmm. I know some are thinking, well, that's not Hyrcania, though. His name is Hyrcanus. They're not the same, are they? Oh, he uses that too and connects it for us. Here we go. John Hyrcanus, or his son, themselves built a Hasmonean fortress. And what did they name it? Well, not Hyrcanus, they named it Hyrcania. After Hyrcanus, to commemorate him, it's the same. Josephus even goes so far as to record something few seem to know. That fort and two others were retained by the Hasmoneans because they were precious to them. They had meaning. They were named after their sons. And that fort's name, Hyrcania. Not Hyrcanus. And yet, that is his name. It's the same. However, this is interesting, all the other fortresses, other than those three that they held on to, went under control of the Pharisees, hmm, with their soldiers, their armory. The Pharisees had an army. However, this goes even a step further in connecting future migrations. That's rather mind-blowing as to just whom those peoples were. This name, Hyrcania, connects even more. Georgia, the country, not the state in the U.S., but the country in the Russian steppes, in very close to this area. The Persian name continues an old Iranian Verkan, land of the wolves, presumably related to the Trans-Caspian toponym Gorgon Hyrcania, also reflected in Armenian Verk and a source of the classical name, Iberia. Hmm. By the way, have you heard of the Gorgon Wall? The Hyrcanian Wall, same word. Which was built to keep out giants? Hmm. So Iberia. Now, that's an area right by the Caspian Sea, but the Iberian Peninsula 
also known as Iberia, is located in the southwest corner of Europe, indicating a migration of the people from the Russian steppes into there, which history well confirms. The peninsula is principally divided between Portugal and Spain, comprising most of their territory. It also includes Andorra and a small part of France along the peninsula's northeastern edge, as well as Gibraltar on its south coast. And just who migrated and settled, taking their name with them in that area of Europe? Well, let's see. Even Dictionary.com defines this area, ancient name of the Spanish peninsula, from Greek, Iberus, Celtic people of Spain, also the name given to an Asiatic people near the Caucasus, of unknown origin in both uses of or relating to to ancient Iberia in the Caucasus or its inhabitants, one of the ancient inhabitants of Iberia in Europe, from whom the Basques are supposed to be descended. So they're descending from the Iberians, and the Iberians come from the Russian steppes. Who are the Basques, by the way? And why does this matter? Miguel de Unamuno said, There are at least two things that clearly can be attributed to the Basques, the Society of Jesus, Jesuit Order, and the Republic of Chile. Saint Ignatius of Loyola was a Spanish Basque priest and theologian who founded the religious order called the Society of Jesus, Jesuits, and became its first superior general. Now, he was also known as a Murano, or converso, converted Jew, who converted to Catholicism but still remained a Jew. Loyola was a Kabbalist, especially, and ties perfectly all the way back to the Hasmoneans. What many do not realize is Martin Luther was not being anti-Semitic in writing on the Jews and their lives. He was responding to the Counter-Reformation, which was Loyola and other Iberian Basque Jews from the Caucasus originally, the Jesuits. Some wish to paint the Jesuits as the greatest evil in the world. Others, the Jews or the Nazis or whomever the world elite. Let's be clear. They are all in the same camp, the synagogue of Satan, and they're all defined in Psalm 83. We will cover that throughout this series, which will lead to the New World Order elite. They wish to bring their Messiah on the scene by creating the conditions for his rising, which are the same exact conditions, and his description too, as the beast of Revelation. And again, the War Scroll defines that same faction, may have won the battle in that day, as the Hasmoneans, but it will be involved in the final battle all the way through as the sons of darkness, and they will face off with Messiah and his forces, and they will be eliminated forever. The biggest reason we started questioning this book of Maccabees, or all the books really, is its inconsistency with Scripture, and a very odd narrative where history is concerned, which we've just proven, is just not true. Here's one example, and it is huge in its ramifications, very critical in terms of theology and doctrine. As if this were considered scripture, then it would completely change the definition of salvation of all things. This is no small thing. And prove out the book of Maccabees, and you will find it to be false pagan doctrine. Actually, two false doctrines come from this very passage that you will never find support in Scripture. 
And so, betaking themselves to prayers, they besought him that the sin which had been committed might be forgotten. But the most valiant Judas, this is Judas Maccabee, Judah Maccabeus, exhorted the people to keep themselves from sin. Oh, he's such a great holy guy, right? Oh, yeah, watch what he does. For as much as they saw before their eyes what had happened because of the sins of those that were slain, and making a gathering, he sent 12,000 drachms of silver to Jerusalem for sacrifice to be offered for the sins of the dead, thinking well and religiously concerning the resurrection. For if he had not hoped that they were slain, that they were, that were slain, should rise again, it would have seemed superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. Oh, it is indeed superfluous, excessive, and irrelevant. And because he considered that they who had fallen asleep with godliness had great grace laid up for them, it is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from their sins. Wait a minute. What is that? Because that is not Bible. So this suggests Judah Maccabee has some kind of power to influence one's salvation after death. First, by sending an offering to the temple? Wait a minute. Isn't that the same doctrine that caused the Reformation? Indulgences, where the Catholic Church was teaching you you could pay to have your sins absolved, which is evil, frankly. Nowhere would it ever say that in Scripture. Then, he prays for the dead that he would possibly have the authority to loose them from their sins? That's blasphemy. From the wicked priest, which, by the way, today, many would label the office of Pope. Here's just a few, though. There are many, many more actual scriptures on this, which prove Maccabees is against scripture, just as Pharisee doctrine always is, ultimately. This is Levin. That almost sounds good, because he encourages people not to sin. I mean, that's good, right? Well, and what could be wrong with that? But these two practices that come along with it, that's called Pharisee Levin. So you give them a little good with a whole lot of bad. The need for having a relationship with Yahuwah, with Yahusha, while you are on earth, is all of a sudden goes out the window as a result of this. If it were true, it is not true. It is highly unscriptural. It undermines salvation. It's anti-Bible. Now, we've looked at this in other translations, and it's pretty much the same. But John 8.24, I said, therefore, unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. No amount of prayer after one has died could possibly change that. Luke 16, 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So in other words, when they're dead, they're dead. And Hebrews 9.27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So it sets up two steps. There's physical death, and then there's the final day of judgment. Period. And that's all Scripture ever says, ever. Scripture leaves no such room for these doctrines. And you will find this in the Catholic Church today 
and Maccabees is likely where it originated, an occult writing of a false story that would lead to Zionism. For those wishing to attempt to stretch scripture, saying Paul was praying for the dead when he simply stated in his sermon, while Onesiphorus was likely still alive, in fact, the passage doesn't say that he was dead already, and Paul simply says that he hopes that Yahuwah would have mercy on him on the day of judgment for the things he had done to help Paul. Paul was simply blessing, probably a living man, likely, not praying for the dead. And even if he was dead, that is not a prayer. It's a sermon. There's a big difference. For one claiming Messiah prayed for the dead when he raised Lazarus, that would ignore who he was and what he did. He didn't pray for anyone there. He commanded him to come forth. Three words. Now, raising one from the dead, and then they enter relationship with Messiah? Okay, you can do that. So go ahead. But even your raising them from the dead does not save their soul. Nor is it a factor for Yahuwah. It doesn't work that way. That is an action they must take for themselves. Matthew 7 is very clear. They must know him. He must know them. They must be in relationship with Yahusha. And while they are living, as once they die, then judgment and nothing in between. This is a false doctrine, according to the Bible, and Maccabees is not scripture. The Hasmoneans are identified as living in Samaria, not Judea, as Persians who connect all the way through to the Jesuit order. Imagine that. Wow. But we're just warming up because we have more on this connection coming. They conquered Judea as they are a part of the powers against Israel in Psalm 83, and they will be involved as the evil sons of darkness all the way through till the very end, where they will attempt to battle Messiah. And they will be devoured. It's amazing that so many scholars have missed this characterization, and it's so abundantly clear. The picture is starting to shape up, and it matches Psalm 83 perfectly thus far. Next, we will test each faction, starting with the Assyrians or Samaritan replacements of Israel. You know, the Pharisees, the Farsees, those are Persians, and it is the same root. So we'll test them as a whole which the Hasmoneans are just a subgroup, whose bloodlines include the Philistines and Gaphtarim, oh, who are recorded as giants, as living among them at least. Ouch. We follow the trail of evidence where it leads, and it went there indeed. We hope you have learned something from this. Thank you for watching our Lost Tribes series. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell or just click the next screen. Share this video with others and check out our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah bless and one final note on our coming conferences in the Philippines. Tim, you've uh, started making the videos just over two years ago. I said, Timothy, why do they know you? <laughs> so finally you get well, to see his face, you get to know. But, but that's the whole point. Our ministry is, is it's not about my ugly face. You can tell <laughs> <laughs> if it's about this, we're in trouble, right? Seriously. No, when it comes down to it, the Bible says that you test a ministry by its fruits. And we almost force you that. Because if you go to our channel and you re just read the comments from a lot of Filipinos. On a final note, 
We really want to shout out to all our Patreon supporters who are supporting the coming May conferences in the Philippines and all those who are praying. Thank you. Thus far, we have about 12 venues and what looks to be a huge one in Manila, especially which we hope to announce soon. We have announced many of the venues at this point, and you will find them on screen now. These are confirmed hosts, and most have confirmed venues at this point. However, we are working on more, even for the month of May, and our intention is to continue conferences in the Philippines beyond that. Again, we appreciate the support of our Patreon patrons who are giving monthly to support this effort. And on the next screen, you can click the link to participate as well, if you feel led. It's time to take this message of Solomon's Gold series to the Filipino people. First, because we firmly believe they are the ones in Scripture that are prophesied to rise up first in this generation, and rise they shall. Yahuwah. Bless.